Chapter 1 Introduction The experimental chemist in his daily work and thought is concerned with observing and, to as great an extent as possible, understanding and interpreting his observations on the nature of chemical compounds. Today, chemistry is a vast subject. In order to do thorough and productive experimental work, one must know so much descriptive chemistry and so much about experimental techniques that there is not time to be also a master of chemical theory. Theoretical work of profound and creative nature, which requires a vast training in mathematics and physics, is now the particular province of specialists. And yet, if one is to do more than merely perform experiments, one must have some theoretical framework for thought. In order to formulate experiments imaginatively and interpret them correctly, an understanding of the ideas provided by theory as to the behavior of molecules and other arrays of atoms is essential. The problem in educating student chemists and in educating ourselves is to decide what kind of theory and how much of it is desirable. In other words, to what extent can the experimentalist afford to spend time on the theoretical studies, and at what point should he say, beyond this I have not the time or the inclination to go? The answer to this question must of course vary with the special field of experimental work and with the individual. In some areas, fairly advanced theory is indispensable. In others, relatively little is useful. For the most part, however, it seems fair to say that molecular quantum mechanics, that is, the theory of chemical bonding and molecular dynamics, is of general importance. As we shall see in chapter 5, the number and kinds of energy levels that an atom or molecule may have are rigorously and precisely determined by the symmetry of the molecule or of the environment of the atom. Thus, from symmetry considerations alone, we can always tell what the qualitative features of a problem must be. We shall know, without any quantitative calculations whatever, how many energy states there are and what interactions and transitions between them may occur. In other words, symmetry considerations alone can give us a complete and rigorous answer to the question, what is possible and what is completely impossible? Symmetry considerations alone cannot, however, tell us how likely it is that the possible things will actually take place. Symmetry can tell us that, in principle, two states of the system must differ in their energy, but only by computation or measurement can we determine how great the difference will be. Again, symmetry can tell us that only certain absorption bands in the electronic or vibrational spectrum of a molecule may occur, but to learn where they will occur and how great their intensity will be, calculations must be made. Some illustrations of these statements may be helpful. Let us choose one illustration from each of the five major fields of application that are covered in part two. In chapter seven, the symmetry properties of molecular orbitals are discussed, with emphasis on the pi molecular orbitals of unsaturated hydrocarbons, although other systems are also treated. It is shown how problems involving large numbers of orbitals, and thus potentially high order secular equations can be formulated, so that symmetry considerations simplify these equations to the maximum extent possible. It is also shown how symmetry considerations permit the development of rules of great simplicity and generality, the so-called Woodward-Hoffman rules, governing certain concerted reactions. In chapter 8, the molecular orbital approach to molecules of the A, B, N type is outlined. In chapter 9, the symmetry considerations underlying the main parts of the crystal and ligand field treatments of inner orbitals and complexes are developed. In chapter 10, it is shown that by using symmetry considerations alone, we may predict the number of vibrational fundamentals, their activities in the infrared and Raman spectra, and 
and the way in which the various bond and interbond angles contribute to them for any molecule possessing some symmetry. The actual magnitudes of the frequencies depend on the interatomic forces in the molecule, and these cannot be predicted from symmetry properties. However, the technique of using symmetry restrictions to set up the equations required in calculations in their most amenable form, the FG matrix method, is presented in detail. In chapter 11 of this edition, the symmetry properties of extended arrays, that is, space group rather than point group symmetry, is treated. In recent years, the use of X-ray crystallography by chemists has increased enormously. No chemist is fully equipped to do research or read the literature critically in any field dealing with crystalline compounds without a general idea of the symmetry conditions that govern the formation of crystalline solids. At least the rudiments of this subject are covered in chapter 11. The main purpose of this book is to describe the methods by which we can extract the information that symmetry alone will provide. An understanding of this approach requires only a superficial knowledge of quantum mechanics. In several of the applications of symmetry methods, however, it would be artificial and stultifying to exclude religiously all quantitative considerations. Thus, in the chapter on molecular orbitals, it is natural to go a few steps beyond the procedure for determining the symmetries of the possible molecular orbitals, and explain how their requisite linear combinations of atomic orbitals may be written down, and how their energies may be estimated. It has also appeared desirable to introduce some quantitative ideas into the treatment of ligand field theory. It has been assumed necessarily that the reader has some prior familiarity with the basic notions of quantum theory. He is expected to know in a general way what the wave equation is, the significance of the Hamiltonian operator, the physical meaning of a wave function, and so forth, but no detailed knowledge of mathematical intricacies is presumed. Even the contents of a rather qualitative book such as Coulson's valence should be sufficient, although, of course, further background knowledge will not be amiss. The following comments on the organization of the book may prove useful to the prospective reader. It is divided into two parts. Part 1, which includes chapters 1 through 6, covers the principles that are basic to all of the applications. The applications are described in part 2, embracing chapters 7 through 11. The material in part 1 has been written to be read sequentially, that is, each chapter deliberately builds on the material developed in all preceding chapters. In part 2, however, the aim has been to keep the chapters as independent of each other as possible, without excessive repetition, although each one, of course, depends on all the material in part 1. This plan is advantageous to a reader whose immediate goal is to study only one particular area of application, since he can proceed directly to it, whichever it may be. It also allows the teacher to select which applications to cover in a course too short to include all of them, or, if time permits, to take them all but in an order different from that chosen here. Certain specialized points are expanded somewhat in appendices in order not to divert the main discussion too far or for too long. Also, some useful tables are given as appendices. Finally, Appendix 9 provides a reference list for each of the five chapters in Part 2, indicating where further discussion and research examples of the various applications may be found.